Good morning. Welcome to worship with us this morning. Please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are glad that you joined us either here in the sanctuary or by live stream. The bulletin with community prayers and hymn notes is available by scanning the QR code on your mobile device at any of the entrances. The nursery is available today for children younger than Sunday school age. The nursery can be accessed by using the front stairs and following the signs. After worship, refreshments will be held in the narthex today. We hope you will take time to have a snack and have a little conversation with your community. Please hold the family and friends of Sue Bogan in your prayers. Sue died this last Wednesday, July 10th. A memorial service will be held here at First Congregational Saturday, August 3rd at 4 o'clock. That will be in the newsletter as well. Saturday, August 3rd at 4 o'clock. Please plan to join First Congregational Community for the cookout potluck sponsored by the Board of Community Life. It will be held this Saturday at 5 p.m. at Lake Farm Park. It is a great opportunity to meet new friends and to get to know each other a little bit better. Let us now enter our time of worship together. Please stand in body or spirit as we join in our call to worship. Where there is bigotry, let us envision love. Where we see injustice, let us act with righteousness. Where we lose justice, 
let us find mercy. Facing the brokenness of this world, we ask for courage to seek healing. This day and every day that we draw breath, we ask God for strength to speak truth to power. Justice calls to us and asks us to be a plumb line of peace to our neighbors. We must recommit ourselves to this leveling for peace over and over again. Let us do that now as we share signs of peace with one another with these words. May the peace of God be with us all. And we invite you to greet your neighbors with a wave and remember our friends on live stream. Let us join our voices together in prayer. We hear you calling us, loving God, to a life of humility, compassion, and justice. Keep your call before us that we may recognize and celebrate our oneness in you. May your spirit unite us in the bond of peace. Guide us in the path of Jesus who taught his disciples to bear with one another in love. Draw us to a common faith, even as we value our diversity. Lead us into new depths of trust beyond our knowing and along new pathways of service outdistancing our fear. Amen. You may be seated.
We now invite the children to come forward. Come on up and have a seat on the steps. And just a reminder to grab a sheep if you're going traveling. Share your sheep. Send me the pictures, the selfies of you with your sheep. There's some on the back table. All right. It is so great to see all of you today. I wanted to ask you some questions. Let's say, let's see, oh, pull this out. I've got a lot of work to do today. Let's say we were gonna build a tower, all right? Let's say we wanted to build a really tall tower, okay? What are some problems we might run into if we're trying to build a really tall tower? Any ideas? What are some problems we might run into, Johnny? It might fall over, okay? It might fall over. Might run out, well, let, okay, good question. Might, might run out of materials. Let's say we have unlimited supply of materials. We can just keep building till we reach the sky, okay? So we've got that taken care of. So if we're building, and as Johnny said, we might, what might happen? It might fall over. Do we like it when a tower falls over? It's kind of fun, but if we're trying to build a really tall tower, we don't want it to fall over, right? So what are some ways we can make sure it doesn't fall over, okay? Any ideas? What are some ways we can make sure it doesn't fall over? Thoughts? Anybody? Indigo? Oh, stack it like Jenga, the way you stack it. Right, it makes it a more stable structure, okay? That's when we could build it in a certain way that it would hold together, all tied together. Okay, but even a Jenga tower, does, do they ever fall over? Sometimes they do. You take pieces out, right, right, right. So I have a, something I wanna show you. Oh, that's a little shaky. I'm, for those in the pews, we're building a tower up here. I wanna share with this something with you. What do you see here? String, right, and what's on the bottom of the string? Some, these are like washers. It's some sort of weight. So if I hold it up like this, where do the weights go? Down, okay. So what force is making the weights go down? Anybody have an idea? Gravity, gravity will always pull the string straight to the earth. Did you hear that? It will always pull the th string straight to the earth, so we know we've got a straight line, right? So we know we've got a straight line. We can use the powers that are around us to make a straight line. So what builders will do when they're building really tall buildings, they will use something like this. Anybody know what this is? What this is called? It's a string, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. There's a special name for this apparatus. It's called a Plumb line, plumb line. Say that with me, plumb line. And it's called a plumb because the Latin for lead, because they would use lead, which we don't use today because it's dangerous, but in those days they didn't care, okay? They would use lead because it was really heavy. So the Latin word for lead is sort of like plumb, sounds like plumb. So they would put a weight on there with lead and then they would hold it next to the building or put it next to the building. Can you see, how would I use the plumb line to make a tower taller and more solid? Any ideas? Any ideas, Will? By making it straighter and would be able to support more weight. Because where's gravity gonna pull this tower? Straight down, if we make it straight up, we can get it taller and taller. All right. So now you can go to school, or be, if you're ever on Jeopardy, you know what a plumb line is. You can impress your friends, okay? So plumb line helps us to build towers. This is this force we call gravity, and we use that force to help us build taller towers. All right? Now we can use this in our own lives. This, the plumb line, the force of gravity, we could also say we could live our lives like this. All right, we could live our lives. Meaning, if we have a force that's showing us how to build towers, how to live our lives, we can go back to that force 
and help us to build lives that are upright and solid and strong, okay? This is why we, go to, we have Sunday school, to learn about this guy named Jesus who taught us a lot about how to live lives that are upright and strong and true and help us to understand how to treat each other, how to respect each other, how to love one another, because when we do that, we're building lives that are upright and strong and true. This is why we come to church. This is why we go to Sunday school. And this is why we learn the teachings of Jesus, helping us to live lives. All right, let's pray. Loving and strong God, be with us every day, even those days where we're leaning a little bit and we're not sure what's going to happen. Help us to be strong. Help us to be upright. And help us to be true. Amen. All right. So nursery is for kids under, and Sunday school is for kids go, finishing grades one through five or six. You can go to, okay. Or, oh, and Ruth is right here. She'll take you up there. Um, younger kids, we'll see you in the nursery. All right, let's go to Sunday school. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Older Testament, Amos 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, Earn your bread there and prophecy there, but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go. Prophesy to my people, Israel. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that live in all our hearts Ground us more deeply and firmly in your love and your divine work of justice in our world. Amen. My drive to church takes me from the east side of Madison to the west side, up Regent Street, past the corner of Park Street, where a new multi-story building has been under construction for what seems like a very long time now. I'm sure others of you know this pathway. 
So I've had a lot of time in stopped traffic to watch the construction at various stages. I have to say I am in awe as I watch the equipment and the large team of workers moving around the site doing various jobs independently that will eventually result in a fully functional building where people will live and work. How they end up with a structure that is grounded and doesn't fall over confounds me. I am sure that technology continues to improve the way construction is done. But one thing I know that hasn't changed over the centuries is that leveling is key. I read an article this week about the Millennium Tower, a residential skyscraper in San Francisco that developed problems because of leveling in the years following its completion in 2009. The building began to sink and tilt. The problem was attributed to several factors, one being that the foundation was constructed on a landfill rather than on solid bedrock, which led to uneven settling and the tilt. Concerns were raised about the design and the construction deficiencies that may have impacted the building's structural integrity. But then there were other issues that were not planned for, including nearby construction that they didn't know was gonna happen in the way that it did, changes in the groundwater levels, and possibly natural events such as an earthquake in that area. All of this says that even if leveling is done properly during construction, it must be readdressed over time as the situation changes in or around the building. Well, as you know by now, our scripture today is about a different kind of leveling. And it does ask us to consider the use of a construction tool, the plumb line. The plumb line is part of a vision given to the prophet Amos. Prophets were messengers of God who were believed to have been chosen to deliver divine messages, warnings, and prophecies to the people of Israel. Prophets were particularly concerned with what we might call today social and economic justice issues. They were willing to take on the establishment, discomfort their listeners, and risk their own status because they were so convinced that God had given them a message to bring that would further the cause of justice. Amos was most likely a rural farmer in the southern part of Israel, active during the 8th century. He spent his life tending to his farm, worshiping God, and holding to task the social, political, and religious structures of Israel in their failures to hold ethical responsibility. Amos is the prophet who spoke the words made famous by Martin Luther King Jr. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. In our text today, Amos tells of a vision he had. God was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line and God had a plumb line in God's hand. The plumb line is understood to be used in measurement, as we saw with Jeff's vertical hanging cord with the weight on the other end. It's used to ensure that a, set, that a structure is centered. But the word that's used here can also be translated as something metal. And in some of the earlier English translations of this text, it's called a mason's trowel and the Jewish study Bible calls it a pickaxe. Well, we know the mason's trowel would be used in brickwork or stonework for leveling of a different kind, 
for spreading, for shaping the mortar or the concrete. A pickaxe would be used to get rid of the sharp edges or any unnecessary pieces. So there's a leveling and a smoothing and a building up that happens, but there is also often cutting off, tearing down and removing pieces or sharp edges. All of this points to the same idea in construction. There's a constant need throughout the whole project and beyond to work at leveling, at building, at refining, and even sometimes rebuilding. In the vision recorded in Amos, God said, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Well, these are pretty graphic descriptions. They're not easy words to read, and they're not easy words to hear. It seems to me that in language we might use today, God is using Amos to say something like, I will ignore their sins no more. I will no longer ignore the ways they have become unlevel or separated in their devotion and in their practice of the religious laws demanding justice. Amos lived in a relatively peaceful time between the northern and the southern kingdoms. And yet the reality in that culture was that though many prospered, not everyone did. There were huge inequities between the rich and the poor. The wealthy landowners manipulated debt and credit using the smallest loans to confiscate land from small farmers and trap them into indentured servitude. God was judging these unjust practices. It was time for some leveling. Well, what about us? Is God judging us and calling us to do some leveling of our own? To be honest, I struggle with scriptures like this that portray God in some kind of threatening way, particularly when I try to balance that with my understanding of God's divine and unconditional love. But I also wonder if divine love and divine judgment can also somehow exist together. Amos and the other prophets help me remember that the concept of justice has no bearing if God cannot be offended by the ways we perpetuate injustices. At the same time, the prophets also remind us that divine judgment is always, always held firmly in divine love and mercy. We will never be abandoned by God. And maybe the judgment that we experience comes in the form of our own conscience and the nudges we get to do better for all God's children. I know I must be willing to do some leveling in my own heart and mind over and over again. Am I allowing myself to be leveled? Am I acting in level-headed ways in my reactions and responses to those I disagree with in particular? Are there parts of me that need to be cut away by that pickaxe or smoothed over by that mason's trowel? And then as Christians, how does Jesus exemplify for us how we respond to injustices?
In what way does Jesus exemplify a sense of leveling held in divine love? Frederick Beekner is a contemporary theologian and writer who, for me, often captures some of the traditional concepts of Christianity and helps them make sense in our contemporary time. And here is what he writes about understanding judgment as a Christian. The New Testament proclaims that at some unforeseeable time in the future, God will ring down the final curtain on history, and there will come a day on which all our days and all the judgments upon us and all our judgments upon each other will themselves be judged. The judge will be Christ. In other words, the one who judges us most finally will be the one who loves us most fully. Romantic love, he goes on to say, is blind to everything except what is lovable and lovely. But Christ's love sees us with terrible clarity and sees us whole. Christ's love so wishes our joy that it is ruthless against everything that diminishes our joy. The worst sentence love can pass is that we behold the suffering that love has endured for us to know God's love. The justice and mercy of the judge are ultimately one. We see and we know every day that there is much work to be done, and we are already doing a lot of good work. But we continue to see injustices in our world and we continue to work so that all of God's children will be heard and valued. Loving our neighbor is indeed hard work. And as Beekner said, may we be ruthless against everything that diminishes our joy and the joy of those who share this world with us. Amen. seated. Let us enter into prayer together.
God of justice and compassion. We hear your call to level, to level the playing field, and wonder how we best follow your direction. We want to work for justice, yet we also get frustrated by a lack of willingness from others to help us. And sometimes people even work against us. And if we are honest, sometimes we just plain run out of energy to fight the good fight. Especially in those times of frustration, help us to find level ground ourselves. A place where we can fully be ourselves, knowing we each have our own inadequacies. In those times when we find ourselves weary and worn out, remind us that it is only when we rest ourselves, a place of being level ourselves, that we can then draw from new energy to do the work of justice leveling. Help us to unite with friends who share a willingness to assist in the work. The energy we bring and share feeds our hearts and souls to do even more work together in community. We give thanks for prophets like Amos, who saw the vision, who heard the vision, and who led others to join in the work. This morning, we also pray for level-headedness in our country. We pray that violence in any form, but especially gun violence, be eliminated. We pray for all who were harmed or impacted by the shooting at the political rally in Pennsylvania yesterday. Give people words to be in conversation so hate does not play the lead role. Let us all be led by love in our words and in our responses. God, the plumb line you place should guide our actions for compassion and justice. We need your presence with us, your guidance to us more than ever so that we can indeed see all people as beloved children of God. Each of us brings our own joys and concerns this morning, and we make space now in this time of silence for those prayers.
the prayers we bring this morning are said in silence, but our work to act is done in community. We join our voices in community in our common prayer saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we heard Amos share his gift of having a vision. He could have been silent. He could have brushed off what he saw in his vision. He could have denied the experience, but he didn't. He used it as a gift to help others. What gifts do we have that we have not realized, accepted, or shared? Gifts can be given via Realm on our website, by mail, or left in the black boxes near the exits. Let us pray. Holy God, may all that we give be signs of our commitment to your vision of a more just world for all. Move us to embrace the ways that we can be as generous and as vulnerable as you are to us as we seek to share more and more of who we are and what we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.
Just as God is ruthless at holding us in divine love and divine judgment, may we recommit ourselves to be ruthless against everything that diminishes joy, our joy and the joy of all those who share this earthly world and life with us. Go in peace. Amen.